Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise due to Allah, and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. In this episode, I would like to discuss the responsibilities of the Muslim student. To understand about the role of the Muslim student, what is required of himself or herself, you know, what are their goals, etc. This is the intent of this episode. And we have to start from the basic command of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, Talabul Elmi Farida ala kulli Muslim, seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. This is our beginning point. Every Muslim is required to be a student. But in the educational institutions, Muslim educational institutions, that takes on a particular form or a particular format in which it functions, this idea of the student. We're all, as we said, students in one way or another, but the student in the Muslim educational institution, he or she should display certain characteristics which are unique for them. As the seeking of knowledge is called talabul ilm, from the term talab, one who is a student in Arabic is called talib. So, Two students in Arabic are called Taliban. So this episode really focuses on the Taliban. Who are the Taliban? Who are the two students from the Muslim perspective? Well, on one hand, a student who happens to be a Muslim, who could have been a Buddhist or a Hindu, or a Sikh, or an atheist, or anything else. That type of student is not the type of student that the Muslim institution seeks to build. That is the student who is not conscious of his or her Islam. Islam may only be cultural traditions, cultural practices, customs, but there is nothing really coming from inside. They don't have a sense of a Muslim identity. That type of student is not what the Muslim institution seeks to build and actually is detrimental. The presence of this kind of student or the domination of these types of students in the Muslim institution is definitely destructive. The type of student who we call truly the Muslim student is the, the one who is a Muslim who happens to be a student. He could have been a teacher, he could have been a taxi driver, he could have been a dentist or an engineer, he could have been anything else. He is a Muslim or she is a Muslim first and foremost. This is the true Muslim student. And this is what the Muslim education institution seeks to create. So it is essential for the student to realize that seeking knowledge, being a student, in and of itself is a form of worship. It is a form of ibadah in Islam. Why? Because Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had said, seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim, first and foremost. So whatever has been made obligatory for us, by God, through his messenger, is a part of our worship from that one perspective. From another perspective, Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, also said, Man salaka tariqan, yaltemisu fihi ilman, 
Whoever takes a path in which he or she seeks knowledge, Allah makes the path to paradise easy for them. Allah makes the path to paradise easy for them. And whatever will make that path to paradise easy is a form of worship. It has to be something which is pleasing to God. So students should understand first and foremost that their being a student is an act of worship. It is an act of worshiping Allah. And they have been singled out by the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, and put on a special pedestal, one which is blessed by God. The Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, said, Ad dunya mal'una. This world is cursed. Mal'unun ma fiha. And whatever in it is also cursed. Illa dhikrullah. Except for the remembrance of Allah. Wa ma wala. And what helps us to remember Allah. Wa aliman wa muta'allima. And the scholar, the teacher, and the student. Muta'allim. The muta'allim is the talib, another term for talib. So, besides them, the world is cursed. Being a student is being blessed by God in a special way. So, when we seek knowledge in school, we have to keep in mind this foundational principle that we are engaged in an act of worship. Beyond that, we have to be clear that our goals for education are goals which involve seeking knowledge for the sake of benefiting ourselves and benefiting others. Because that knowledge which is gained from the Muslim edu education institution should produce an individual who is beneficial to society, who plays an active role in its development, a positive role. So seeking knowledge for its benefit is something highly regarded in Islam. Prophet Muhammad had said, Khairun nas and fa'uhum lin nas. The best of people are those who are most beneficial to others. He also said, Khairukum man ta'allam al-Qur'an wa allama. The best of you are those who learn the Qur'an as a student and teach it to others. So you are benefiting others with that knowledge. Also, we have a statement from Sufyan al-Thawri, one of the great scholars of the early generation, a contemporary of Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik. He said, as a youth, when I began to seek knowledge, my mother advised me, if you write down 10 words and your faith has not improved, check yourself. If you write down 10 words and your faith has not improved, then check yourself. Meaning that whatever knowledge we're gaining, it should ultimately improve and increase our faith. If our faith is not being increased by it, then it means that we are approaching the knowledge in the wrong way. We're not aware and conscious of our position with regards to that knowledge and how we should seek it. Also, we need to know that seeking knowledge for fame is something cursed. This is a dangerous route for a student to seek knowledge so that he can be the most learned, that people would look up to him, admire him, etc., etc. Because Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had warned that among the first three groups of people who would be thrown into the hellfire at the end of this world would be a Muslim scholar. Where Allah would ask that scholar, what did you do with the knowledge which I gave you? And he will say, oh Allah, I taught the people. I informed them, whatever knowledge you gave me, I passed it on to them, they benefited from it, you know, and I disseminated your knowledge for your sake. And Allah will say, no, you didn't do it for my sake. You did it so that you would be known as 
a great scholar, that people would admire you, that people would hold you in high esteem, people would clap whenever you spoke, people would in, be in awe whenever they saw you or heard your name, etc. That's what you sought. And you have received what you sought in the world. There's nothing for you in the next world. And he will be dragged off on his face and thrown into hell. So seeking knowledge with the wrong intention, destructive. It will break the very goal, the, very, the value, all the value that we seek from knowledge will be lost in the life to come. We may get from it things in this life, but from the next life we won't get anything. Now, how to be a successful student? First and foremost, as we said, we must have a sincere intention. Taqwa has to be there. We have to have a consciousness of God. Because if this is an act of worship, as we know a basic principle in acts of worship is that one has to be conscious of God for that act to be truly considered worship. If one is not conscious of God, then the act is not worship anymore. It becomes a ritual, a blind ritual. So first step is one has to be conscious of God. One has to be aware that they're doing it for the sake of God. They are worshiping God through this act. Secondly, they have to be prepared to do hard work. They have to be hard working. They have to give the best effort that they can. As the Prophet ﷺ said, in Allah yuhibbu min ahadikum idha amila amalan and yutqina. Indeed Allah loves from each and every one of you. Whenever you do a thing or anything, you do it to the best of your ability. So this idea of itqan or doing the best, excellence, is something written into seeking knowledge from the Islamic perspective. So it means that as a student, one should do one's assignments whenever they're given, study what needs to be studied, prepare oneself for the classes, you know, prepare for your examinations, etc with sufficient time to be able to uh, sit the exams successfully. You shouldn't be a student who waits until the last minute. Then you run around trying to find a sheikh or a maulana who will give you a dua by which you will pass your exams. This is quite common. Oftentimes when exam time comes around, I find students coming up to me in my lectures and asking me, Sir, can you give us a dua to pass? I ask, well, uh, did you prepare yourself? Did you study? No, but the exam's tomorrow. What dua is going to save you? Duas don't work like that. Dua supplications to God are supplications to God where you ask for God's help where you deserve it. Not ask for God's help when you've made no effort yourself. So hard work is a requirement in the course of seeking knowledge. Among the requirements is keeping an open mind. One should not be a blind follower in seeking knowledge. One's mind should be open. Of course, on one hand, there's respect of the teacher, and we're going to come to that. But on the other hand, we have to beware of blindly following. It is very important that we don't blindly follow our teachers. We keep an open mind. Teacher teaches us something. Another teacher may teach us something else. And we have to be prepared to investigate which one, in fact, is correct. The books that we read, information that's in it, we don't just blindly accept it. We have to look at the evidences and approach knowledge with a critical perspective. Of course, there are some sources of knowledge like statements of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, statements of the Prophet sallam, which are absolute. They're the truth. We don't have to have doubt about it. But even a verse from the Quran, or a statement of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, which is authentic, can be used outside of its context. Taken out of this context in which it was said and put into another context, it could change the meaning altogether. And that's why even when we're presented with facts which are undoubtable, 
we still have to have an open mind to be able to understand the context in which these facts are passed on to us. Or is this fourthly, yeah? Fourthly, we have to seek knowledge honestly. We have to have honesty in our seeking of knowledge. Honesty, truthfulness, this is something which Islam demands. Prophet had said, a person will continue to be truthful until Allah writes him among the truthful. And that truthfulness will be a means for him or her to enter paradise. Truthfulness is something praiseworthy. Prophet Muhammad was known as Al-Amin, the trustworthy one. He was truthful in whatever he said because that's what being trustworthy means. You give a trust, you say, I'm going to do so and so, you're going to do it. Somebody gives you something to look after, you promise to look after it, you do, keep your promise. This trustworthiness is an important characteristic of the Muslim student. So, as a Muslim student, you don't cheat. You don't cheat in exams, with your homework, etc. This may be common amongst students who happen to be Muslims, or students in general, because the goals of education are no longer the holistic goals of the past. They're goals which are linked with industry and the functioning of society in the sense that each person is being geared to fill a particular niche in the society. You fit in that niche and you serve the society accordingly. So it is materialistic. It earns you a certain amount of money which allows you to buy a house, have a car, get a wife, have kids, etc. So these are your goals. Your goals are not beyond these. So an educational system which focuses on such goals then produces students who are willing to do anything to achieve these goals by any means necessary. So if I'm going to, I need an A to get into college to be able to get my degree to earn and get my home and its car, etc. Then if it means I need to cheat to get there, I'm going to cheat. But the Prophet ﷺ said, Man ghashana falaysa minna. Whoever deceives us, cheats us, is not a true follower of mine. Not a true Muslim. So as a student, one must be honest and truthful. That is an essential component of the Muslim student. Lastly, some people might consider it firstly, there should be a respect for one's teachers. As the Prophet had said, whoever doesn't respect our elders, have mercy on our children, and recognize the rights of our scholars is not of us. Whoever does not respect our elders, the older people in society must be respected. Our parents, uncles, grandfathers, aunts, etc. That is necessary to keep the society together. That elder generation looked after us when we were unable to look after ourselves. If when we grew up, we don't respect them, then this is the breakup of the society. So respect to elders is an essential principle. Also mercy to the children. But the elders also need to be merciful to the children in dealing with them and raising them, etc. Mercy should be shown. Love should be shown. And thirdly, recognizing the rights of our scholars over us. Those who are teaching us, those who are the knowledgeable, they have to be held with respect. So students must respect their teachers. If they don't respect the teachers, they will not learn from them. And for adults, maybe for children, it's easier for them to look at their teachers in awe. And we know that, where students will respect their teachers even more than they respect their own parents. Parents tell them something, teachers tell them something else, they come back and say, teacher said, you know. Teach what the teacher says tends to have even a greater impact on them than what their parents say. Because to a large degree, teachers, students spend more time with their teachers than they do with their parents. So it's not surprising in that sense. Also, they are reinforced by other students hearing and agreeing and you know so they have sort of a peer group which respects that same individual as opposed to you and that child where it's only the child alone you know respecting you but in general as I said it is important for 
students to be taught respect for elders. For elder students, there's a tendency to judge teachers. Um, I don't like the way that teacher presents topic. I don't like the way he talks. I don't like his accent. Um, whatever, you know, I don't like the way she dresses. Female teachers, students might say, well, you know, she doesn't dress properly and this, that, and the other. They may have other considerations that they don't like about their teachers. And as a result, they don't give them the respect which is due to them. And well, how does that affect the whole learning process? It affects it by way of them not giving full attention to the teachers. So they won't be able to take what the teacher has to give. They have a negative attitude towards the teacher, not realizing that the teacher has their role and their responsibilities to convey this body of knowledge. That if we don't have respect for them, we cannot gain that knowledge. So uh, respect for teachers is extremely important. The last point to close off our session is to remember the responsibility or the mission of the Muslim student. It may be put in four points. The first is to use the knowledge in a way pleasing to Allah. We said that seeking knowledge is knowledge for the benefit, not just for the seeking. We take it because it's useful, we try to apply it. So using that knowledge but applying it in a way which is pleasing to Allah. That's the way which ensures that the knowledge gained is worship. Something uh, counted on a scale of good deeds on the day of judgment. Secondly, mission or responsibility of the knowledge is to benefit oneself in legitimate business that one uh, use it for their own livelihood, to look after oneself, to get the basic necessities of life, etc. This is one of the goals. And I'm, I'm saying we shouldn't lose sight of that. We turn it so much into worship that the need to look after our own families, etc. is missing. Thirdly, we have to look at it from a perspective of benefiting society. So there should be some voluntary aspect to the knowledge we're gaining that we give it back to the society in a voluntary way. We're not paid for it. So we're a doctor, we give, take certain time out each week to treat those who are needy who cannot afford it. We're a teacher, same thing. We teach in the society some people who can't afford it. So we take, get away from the pure materialistic approach where any time we give up any of this knowledge, we use it or whatever, we have to get some return in this world for it. Money, no, we have to have that sense of generosity, sharing, concern, care, recognizing that whatever we have is ultimately from God. And whatever people don't have, this is ultimately from God too. And it's a test for us whether we will share what we have with others. And lastly, the, the responsibility of the Muslim student is, as we said in the beginning, to share that knowledge with others. What we learn, we pass on. So a student is ultimately on the way to being a teacher. And in the whole process of his learning, he should be involved in passing it on. As scholars of the past had said that the life of knowledge is in the teaching. The life of knowledge is in the teaching. It keeps the knowledge alive. And with that thought, we'll close this episode thanking you for being with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. اقرأ خيّا ورتل القرآن اصبح بصوتك اسمع لك وانا اقرأ كلام الله داوي نفوسنا لنحس في عماقنا عماقنا الإيمان